Introduce once again our distinguished adjunct professor who is with the Department of Cultural Studies at Lingnan, Professor Akbar Abbas. Uh, he uh, is uh, currently at the University of California, Irvine, has been for some years, since, ever since Hong Kong lost him. And as someone pointed out last week, he became a ghostly presence uh, <laughs> in Hong Kong circles. People quote him, people cite him, people reference his work, but he himself has not been around much. Uh, Lingnan University seized the opportunity to, you know, try and do something about that situation. So he's going to be with us from now um, for, for a three-year period. Unfortunately, not all the time, but uh, at least six weeks in the year, uh, every year. So we're really looking forward to uh, creating a context in which many more questions about the present and future of Hong Kong can also be asked uh, with reference to his work. Uh, this particular talk, uh, however, I'm, I'm saying all this, although Akbar needs no introduction to this audience. It's a more mixed audience than we ever find in cultural studies talks. So I'm very delighted to welcome colleagues from other departments and all the students and others who are here today. Um, I think the talk will speak for itself. I think the image is already speaking for itself. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, without any uh, further ado, I request Akbar to make his presentation, and there will be some time for questions after. Yes, OK. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Right. Thank you. Mm. Um, I started off just trying to say a few remarks and then open things for discussion, but uh, it turned into a kind of mini lecture. So, but I'll keep it short and uh, maybe 45 minutes. And then um, I'll be also talking about things that uh, a lot of you here will know much more than I do because. Uh, I'll probably end up by trying to say something about the, uh, you know, the politics of uh, democratic politics in Hong Kong and China, and uh, that might lead to a kind of spirited uh, uh, discussion. But as I say, you know, uh, um, I say that w without uh, knowledge and uh, with a great deal of trepidation, though for the sake of argument, I will defend to the death every word I say. <laughs> Okay, so the um, the uh, the title is uh, posthumous uh, socialism, and uh, I'm going to basically be using uh, uh, three examples. Uh, I mean, it's a topic that can you know that can proliferate. But I'll focus on on uh, on three things. So the uh, what then is uh, the socialist market economy? Are we dealing with another phase of socialism? or as most of the world uh, would think. Uh, is China today capitalist in everything uh, uh, else but name alone? I mean, there was a famous uh, uh, business magazine that had a cover of Mao uh, 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 and, uh, and a balloon from his mouth uh, which said, uh, show me the money. And I think that's the, that's the view of, of China for most of the world, right? Like it's capitalist already in everything else but name alone. Or uh, a view that uh, I'm, I'm trying to uh, uh, argue for today. Um, uh, more paradoxically, are we dealing with neither the life nor the death of socialism, but with its afterlife, uh, with a posthumous uh, socialism uh, more than uh, post-socialism? The socialism in its posthumous form can have a vitality stronger than ever before. It's not just a case of socialism being more alive uh, than dead today in China, but a case of socialism being more alive when dead, just like a, 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 a preserved building. And the emblem, one emblem for uh, um, posthumous socialism would be Mao's a uh, cryogenized body uh, lying in state in the Mao mausoleum, right? Dead and alive at the same time. Uh, so spatially and, and temporally, uh, post posthumous socialism is more unpredictable and volatile than post-socialism. Whereas in post-socialism, one set of conditions is uh, seen to succeed 
and replace uh, uh, another. In posthumous socialism, we are forced to inhabit overlapping uh, uh, time frames, where a socialist past is not just succeeded and replaced by a capitalist uh, present, but coexists with it. Where, for example, a single party system um, with the state as a final arbiter in all important matters can coexist with the rise of a consumer society where individual choice and preferences are given priorities. In posthumous socialism, therefore, anachronisms of a new and peculiar kind are everywhere. But anachronism uh, does not mean being behind the times. Rather, it is now a sign of the times, a product of the speed of historical change. For example, in a China that seems to be uh, to the outsider, to be obsessed by famous brand names and consumerism, we still find as a very common occurrence, especially when people have had a few drinks, uh, the anachronistic singing of revolutionary songs and recurrent uh, bouts of nostalgia for the Cultural Revolution, I mean, even, even to the extent of uh, nostalgia for Cultural Revolution food, uh, which of course it's not old cuisine by any, by any means. So what we see then in the coming period is not just a change from socialism to, consume, to consumer, consumerism. In fact, it is not change in any familiar sense that we need to understand. Rather, what we must grasp is how change itself um, has changed. How, the, uh, um, how Chinese society has become so dense that it is like a black hole that we cannot see directly. We can only speculate on its nature by studying uh, it, the effects it produces. Effects that we call architecture or art uh, or cinema or, or, or politics and so on and so forth which I think we, uh, one way of regarding these things is see them as uh, effects uh, produced by uh, uh, a social reality that has now become so dense that you can't look at it directly. Now, I'll, I'll proceed now by giving three examples. As I said, you know, uh, uh, maybe hundreds of other examples can be uh, given. Uh, uh, one from architecture. Uh, one from art, and, and uh, I'll end up with a short coda uh, on, uh, on, on politics. So let me begin with, uh, with uh, architecture. Now, one of the things we see in Chinese architecture today is the prevalence of unusual and individualistic buildings. I mean, it's like this is like, like a kind of the mark of, uh, uh, of, of all these Chinese cities, and, and you have. Uh, was that something I said? The, uh, the, you, 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 have, you, you have like uh, uh, um, innovative architects like Herzog and Meron, uh, 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 um, who designed, as you know, the bird's nest, uh, uh, Zaha Hadid, uh, and, and, and uh, Ram Kulhas, uh, who, whose building I'll be uh, talking about. Uh, so the question, I think, behind this is, has subjectivity changed in the wake of posthumous uh, socialism? Are we witnessing the uh, demise of a collective notion of, uh, um, of identity and the rise of, shall we say, uh, uh, individualism, which is how some uh, uh, people in, uh, w w would see it? Or are we wit witnessing instead the emergence not of the individual, but of, of something very different, uh, what uh, some people have called the individual. Right? Not an individual, but the individual. Now, what is the individual? In some anthropological writings on Asian societies, the individual is seen as an uh, instance of a, uh, of a communal self. In other words, a self that uh, defines itself as part of a community and in opposition to selfish individuality. Here, the individual and the individual are seen as two different types of subjects. 
uh, one stressing community, the other uh, the self. Now, by contrast, as uh, Deleuze and others uh, have told us, individual and individual uh, are not uh, uh, clearly uh, 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 distinguishable. The two together form one, shall we say, divided subject, uh, a, a, a DV jaw, right? A divided, not, not a single subject, but a kind of divided subject. And the term serves to alert us to the peculiar nature of individuality in uh, neoliberal society. And even more so in China today, where neoliberal tendencies like deregulation uh, and, and uh, 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 um, you know, free markets and so on and so forth, um, um, grafted onto older social political uh, structures, a particularly viril, virulent form, you might say, of a controlled society. Now, paradoxically, in a controlled society, individual individuality is not suppressed, but very much emphasized and encouraged. But note well, it is not individuality as a form of uh, freedom or resistance to state, church, bureaucracy, and so on, as it was in the Rene songs or in Kierkegaard and, 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 and people like that. Uh, in a controlled society, we believe, or we are made to believe, that we are free to choose and that the choices we make are our own, when all the while the options are predetermined, uh, the deck is stacked. Right? As uh, Henry Ford used to say when he tried to sell his Model T car, he said, you can have any color you like as long as it's black. Right? So, so it's that, that kind of uh, trick that we're, we're, that we're talking about. Um, the control society both gives and takes away. It gives the individual all the affective qualities uh, associated with individuality, like uh, interiority, idiosyncrasy, the charming vagaries of personal choice. Right. I am me, so I do what I like, I choose what I like, right? So the, the, the controlled society uh, gives, the, uh, gives this to the individual, right? the, the sense that, yeah, that uh, you have these choices, but only as substitutes that take away the subject's power or ability in to intervene in or have an effect on the world. Unfortunately, uh, ultimately, sorry, the individual in control societies is persuaded to believe in an individuality that no longer exists. A spectral posthumous individuality that has an uncanny structural resemblance to posthumous socialism. Now this drama of the individual subject is writ large, it seems to me, all over the new architecture uh, in China's uh, major cities. The best and most uh, famous example uh, is the CCTV uh, tower built by Ram Kulas in Beijing, uh, 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 in, in, the, in Beijing's, uh, let's see, you all know this, right? oh, unless it's wrong. Oh, sorry, that's my telephone. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm sure you're, you're, you're all familiar with that, uh, uh, that building, right? Um, so for me, the best and most famous example of what I'm trying to define as the individual is uh, this CC Tower building by Ram Kulhas uh, on the Third Ring Road. Now, formally speaking, there's a lot to admire in Kulhas' design for a building that serves as the nerve center of the media and information uh, networks of China. Kulhas designed it as a kind of reconfigured skyscraper, not a vertical skyscraper uh, to be sure, but a, but a skyscraper nevertheless. One, as it were, contorted and distorted by applying the, and I think that's the point he makes, by applying the the uh, paranoid critical method of Salvador Dali, uh, 
right? So instead of it going up, it sort of bends itself in, in all these ways. There's nothing in common with the full frontal monumentality of other uh, buildings that, uh, that used to line uh, 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 Chang'an Avenue. The contortions in Kulhas' building produce large voids in the structure and allow the building to look different when viewed from a different angle. But these formal questions, and uh, the many more of these uh, very highly interesting questions, it's a very interesting building, formally speaking, but these formal questions pale in significance uh, in comparison with what was always the central question about the CCTV uh, tower, namely, why should an arch-conservative institution like CCTV commission an ultra-innovative architect like Kulhas to design its headquarters? Now, there can be many different answers to the question, including the importance of the star architect, probably a Pritzker Prize winner and, 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 and all that. But even if we argue for the architect as being uh, like a kind of brand uh, name for a corporate building, CCTV's choice of uh, Kulas remains a puzzle because the state company could have chosen an equally well-known uh, but less challenging architect or proved a less, as it were, a, 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 a radical design. So closer to the truth, it seems to me, and this is speculation, of course, uh, is that in China today, even the socialist state, uh, even socialist state enterprises, however conservative, are constrained to display signs of individuality. It's not necessarily individuality, it's it, it dis displaying signs of individuality. In other words, whatever else it is, the CCTV building is a monument to the individual, a sign of our times, and more specifically, a sign of the volatile space of posthumous uh, socialism, where the same thing and its opposite can coexist uh, in, uh, in the same space as well. Now, so that's my first example. So let me turn to my second one, which is the, the artist, uh, internationally famous now, uh, Ai Weiwei. Because the case of Ai Weiwei is as good an ex uh, exemplification as any of the complications of the socialist market economy. The present regime, in fact, uh, as we know, encourages creativity in the arts, just as it encourages private enterprise. We see the proliferation of art uh, districts, state-sponsored uh, art biennials, and so on. On the other hand, however, we also see the palpable presence of censorship uh, which can be both crude and irrational. Uh, what is disturbing and confusing uh, uh, um, in China today is not so much lack of freedom, it is at least arguably uh, uh, true that uh, uh, there is in fact ostensibly more freedom now than during the pre tiananmen uh, era. What is disturbing is this constant oscillation, this constant going back and forth um, between permissiveness and prohibition, uh, free agency and control, right? the pit and the pendulum uh, at all levels of social and cultural life. And it is in this climate that the case of Ai Weiwei can be understood. Ai Weiwei is among Chinese artists the one um, most outspokenly critical of the state and its abuse or neglect of human rights. Uh, he is also an entrepreneur and self-promoter and is certainly one of the richest artists in China. The official reason, uh, as you might know, for his uh, 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 recent house arrest well, a few years ago is uh, tax evasion. Uh, like Walt Whitman, Ai Weiwei is, uh, is large. He, he contains multitudes. His position is a curious and contradictory one. Let me say that. By being beaten up or arrested by the authorities, 
and tolerated or even deferred to. When the police arrest him, they apologize. At times, his work is banned in China. At other times, he is the country's unofficial artistic emissary on the international stage. The state plays a game with Ai Weiwei, and he plays a game with the state, the high stakes game of control and defiance. Now, take to begin with some, uh, take some of his artworks uh, to begin with uh, a, a recent minor, but uh, um, nevertheless representative example. Uh, Ai Weiwei's design for a shopping bag for Muji, right? This bag for Muji. Oh, sorry. Uh, should be. Uh, that's a Muji bag. I'll go back to the other one later. Now, it's, uh, at, uh, at first sight, the design seems to show nothing more than a, a cute image uh, of a fleecy animal. Uh, until we realize that the vernacular uh, term for this animal, uh, in, in, in Cantonese it's chou nai, chou nai ma, chou ni ma, my potong wa. But chou ni ma, with a slight change of accent, becomes like chou ni ma, which is fuck your mother. Right, so so chao ni ma, which is a innocuous description of this, and it becomes uh, an expletive, right? a, 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 a swear word. When um, uh, so the image, which seems like a juvenile joke, is a way of swearing at the government while bypassing uh, censorship, which suggests that the um, grass uh, mud horse is also a kind of Trojan horse. Uh, designed to slip an expletive past the authorities. Now, consider now a more uh, quote unquote serious work, which is Ai Weiwei's uh, famous photo triptych of the artist uh, dropping uh, a supposedly real Han uh, vase, right? Very expensive thing, uh, uh, you know, uh, cultural, uh, cultural treasure, and so on and so on. Uh, <coughs> The triptych uh, is not just a revival of cultural revolution type gestures aimed at destroying uh, traditional culture and aesthetics. Rather, it is a work that interrogates art history and frees the artist from the tyranny of art historical uh, assumptions, a bit like Duchamp, for example, painting a moustache on the, on the Mona Lisa. But there's a further point, which is this. In this work, art history becomes a kind of proxy for, uh, uh, for state authority. Right? The, the, the authority of art history, uh, the values that it inculcates. It's a little bit like the, the way in which we uh, uh, passively uh, submit to state, um, uh, to state uh, 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 authority. So interrogating the authority of art history, right? in this case, with this destructive gesture of, of destroying the, 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 the Han vase, is a way of interrogating the state and its authority. However, it would be a little misleading to see Ai Weiwei simply as a critic of Chinese uh, uh, repression and a defender of freedom and individuality. Value said the U.S. believes it, uh, 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 it embodies par excellence. It's true that Ai Weiwei gives the, the finger to the forbidden city. Look at this next one. Right, so, uh, whatever, Chao uh, Ni Ma. But he also gives the same finger to other centers uh, 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 of power, right? In this case, the the White House. In this case, uh, there's no discrimination. Um, the obvious way of reading Ai Weiwei, uh, Ai Weiwei's artworks and performances, which the artist himself might agree with, is to read them as emancipatory gestures designed to subvert state repression. Another way, which is what I'm suggesting, 
uh, is to read him as someone who has learned how to live under extreme conditions, like those organisms that microbiologists have recently discovered that can thrive on toxic waste. What defines his art uh, is the game that Ai Weiwei plays with the state, sometimes with serious consequences. The game is to turn censorship itself, toxic uh, for art production, into something enabling to thrive on and not simply survive these conditions, to swim and not just, as it were, float in the destructive element. This means nothing less than enlisting the repressive state as a collaborator in the uh, production of artworks, uh, which I think is a paradoxical and quite uh, a unique gesture. And to make repression itself a source and a resource of emancipation. So a dangerous and paradoxical game, which is why some of Ai Weiwei's well wishes and admirers in the West, who know nothing about what is involved, who know nothing about the stakes, think he should leave the country, uh, which he has done now. Except that this might be the worst thing for him as an artist. Take away the destructive element, and Ai Weiwei would be like a fish out of water. Adulation can be as toxic as repression, it seems. So we'll have to see how he fares. I mean, I think he's in Germany now. Uh, now, my third example, my third instance, and this is where I hope you could all jump in and, and jump on me, uh, would be um, Hong Kong politics. Uh, what can Ai Weiwei's um, ambiguous example suggest uh, beyond um, uh, uh, the question of art in the era of posthumous socialism? I mean, is it, the story just something about art? Uh, but uh, what can it suggest also about the question of a democratic politics in Hong Kong's uh, relation to China? And I, I, I know a lot of you have been uh, actively involved uh, in all this, and, and you know a lot about this, so I hope we will have a discussion. I'll just make a few uh, uh, um, amateurish uh, points. Now, <coughs> democracy uh, in Hong Kong, we, we know, became an issue uh, only fairly recently, uh, um, I would say um, only in the 1980s uh, 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 with the news of Hong Kong's uh, impending return uh, to, uh, to China. I mean, we never had uh, very much talk of that before. But since the 80s, of course, it becomes a big uh, uh, issue. Now, recall three points of the older uh, uh, democracy movement. Uh, the first point is this, uh, uh, just listen. The, uh, uh, the major impetus to the uh, democracy movement was, of course, Tiananmen 1989. Uh, June the 4th is still uh, commemorated uh, uh, yearly. And uh, from this point of view, uh, democracy becomes, in, in a sense, another word for fear and mistrust of China, which I think a lot of us might think is, in fact, justified. But that's how it began. The movement for, uh, uh, um, targets uh, Beijing, interestingly enough, but never British colonialism. So it's not just, it's not just a, a, a democracy uh, a, a against colonialism and against oppression. It's, it's basically also a, a kind of uh, d uh, distrust and mistrust of, of China, uh, but not British colonialism. Uh, you never have any critiques of that. So the second point would be this. The colonial uh, administration uh, on the eve of their forced departure uh, suddenly became passionate advocates of uh, democracy. Right? Patton, you remember, gave us his 16 famous benchmarks for democracy at the moment when the bench was being pulled away from under uh, British uh, colonialism. And thirdly, the China of the older democracy movement is still, in a sense, China, the China of Tiananmen. In other words, caught in a kind of freeze frame uh, uh, with images of tanks against uh, uh, 
uh, helpless students, and so on and so forth. But Tiananmen, uh, I think we can now see, was also the first instance in contemporary Chinese history, the first instance of a confrontation between two forms of power. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's not exactly true that you have uh, uh, one power who, who are just trying to destroy people who have power. It's actually a confrontation between two forms of power. Uh, the old forms, which is military force and state control, versus the new power of information and global networks. Because uh, the students, for example, had Newsweek and Time magazine and World Opinion on, on their side. And the thing, of course, is that this is a lesson that China learned very well after Tiananmen. Right? So it's no longer brute force, it's also the, all this other stuff that, that it's doing. So these are like uh, um, uh, um, some of the historical background, it seems to me. Of the, but of course, what changed all this? And there's probably something we, we can agree on. Uh, 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 is in fact the umbrella movement, which has to be distinguished uh, from the uh, the older uh, democracy movement in its motives, its leaders, and its tactics. In many ways, and maybe this is its uh, most salient characteristic, it was an unprecedented event. Right? And the thing about the un uh, an event whether it's an art event or political event. It's an event is not just, in, just something that happens. An event is something that happens that has never happened before. Right? So it has this unpredictable uh, uh, and volatile uh, uh, quality uh, to it. And because of that, it's something that's hard to explain. Right? Uh, uh, instead, many try to explain it away by reaching for their favorite cliches or critical pieties. And of course, in a crisis, when we, know, when we don't know what to say, what do we reach for? The first thing we re reach for are our favorite cliches. So some critics saw the Occupy movement in terms of a generation gap. Now, you've all heard this. And the participants as passionate, idealistic, but basically naive and, uh, and immature. The movement has been called many things from an impractical form of populist democracy. This was uh, Richard Wang, I think he's a professor of politics at Hong Kong U, uh, to a, quote, phony disobedience uh, movement by the journalist Michael uh, Chugani. And the more, uh, and the more literate, literate critics even quoted Oscar Wilde's line that uh, youth is wasted on the young. Uh, on the other hand, progressive critics saw the movement in an equally cliched way uh, as an abstract issue of democracy and self-determination uh, 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 without uh, 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 any historical specificity. This abstract idea of democracy was what allowed, as we saw, the last colonial government, Chris Patton, to uh, to pose obscenely as a champion of democracy in Hong Kong, uh, conveniently forgetting that there was never any democracy under British uh, rule. Now, what then can be said about uh, Occupy Hong Kong as event? Uh, let me just uh, hazard very tentatively uh, 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 three sets of comments. Uh, first and foremost, it was a spatial event. And uh, an attempt at spatial interruption uh, whose outcomes did not turn out as planned. Those who took part in the movement saw the city in a different way. They became aware that spatial configurations other than the established ones uh, were possible. These spaces were also where we saw artworks uh, being produced. These artworks were on the whole ephemeral products of the moment, sometimes crude, hardly masterpieces. But uh, they took their energy from what was happening on the streets. And that gave them uh, a vitality that uh, distinguished them from kitsch. Uh, just as the Occupy movement changed our perception of the city, 
So it's art change our perception of art. Uh, not as something that others can do, but as something that we ourselves can do. So Occupy Hong Kong provided an outlet for the city's creative energies, which had so far been too narrowly channeled and directed towards um, instrumental goals. Now, the second comment would be this. Um, another unpredictable aspect of, uh, of the uh, umbrella movement, uh, which marked it as an, as an event, was its relative uh, longevity. Uh, when participants were uh, asked about why they stayed, right, when everything seemed hopeless, uh, even against the, the, uh, the advice of parents and, 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 and teachers and, and so on and so on, uh, and at great personal risk to themselves, many of them said it was because of the intense friendships they experienced in the movement. Uh, 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 that intense friendship they, it was something that they had never experienced uh, before. Friendship in this context clearly has a political meaning. A politics of friendship means organizing a movement or a society not from top down or bottom up, but laterally, where we find not the paternalistic relations of parents to children, but of uh, relations between brothers and sisters, or better still, between friends. So it's not a question now of delinquent children. It's very much a question of delinquent parents. Uh, the movement was not an abstract lesson in democracy. It was a practical lesson we are still trying to understand in how to live together. But one important point uh, 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 to add is that the politics of friendship did not work. The idea took hold for a while, but turned out to be too unstructured as an organizational model. And this leads me now to a final comment, uh, which concerns whether the movement had indeed failed, or whether democracy itself has failed in Hong Kong, or has failed Hong Kong. After the protest was uh, cleared, it was, click it was quickly back to business as usual. Uh, these outcomes were entirely predictable uh, right from the beginning, given the tremendous odds against the students succeeding in getting their demands met. However, one outcome was not entirely predictable. Even as it became clear that resistance was futile, it continued. We find here not a failure of resistance, but rather failure as resistance. A politics of failure that is not the same as a failed politics. And that has its own kind of heroism, quite different from uh, other kinds of heroism. For example, uh, for Kant, uh, the German philosopher and the Enlightenment, uh, the motto was always dare to know, have the courage to combat and overcome prejudice and superstition. But in the volatile spaces of today, our, uh, 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 our motto may have to be dare to fail. Failure, we might say, is the moral heroism of our time, in social life as well as in our art. It's what allows us to act and create under conditions of impossibility. To act not because we have hope, but because we refuse to give in to despair. Thank you. Hello, thank you, Akbar. That was, you've covered a lot of ground in such an elegantly concise talk. I would just like to just jump off from your first very, uh, from your last very provocative sentence about the politics of failure mm. as a kind of horizon of hope and action and agency. Um, what kind of temporality would, would result from such a politics of failure? What vision of the future um, results from this? I was hearing a sense of stoicism, mm. uh, right. yeah, a moral, a kind of moral stance of stoicism. Um, but what what sort of future right. would be imagined from such a from such a a stoic stance? Mm. 
Well, I, I see why you say stoicism, but it's probably uh, 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 not really that. Um, the, uh, so the point I'm making about uh, uh, failure, right, is that, uh, and hope, is that we don't act because there is hope. Because, I mean, hope is not like this carrot that we need in order to do something. Right? I mean, the, 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 the more difficult thing is to act without the carrot. Right? And we act not because we hope for something, right? but because we refuse to give in to despair. Right? So disappointment here is linked a little bit to this uh, word, uh, um, I've given the, uh, uh, failure in, in this sense is linked to the word disappointment, right? But disappointment, not in the sense that, oh, I wanted this, I didn't get it, so I'm disappointed. Doesn't mean that. Disappointment can also have a kind of spatial, uh, it's also a kind of spatial idea, huh? or a temporal idea, that, uh, that things are not in their appointed places, right? All appointments are disappointments. I mean, you see this, of course, very much in Wong Kar Wai's films, <laughs> right? I mean, the, the whole, <laughs> I mean, so somewhere where, 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 where I've called the erotics of disappointment, right? Where disappointment itself can become erotic, right? And this is what you see in, in Wong Kar Wai. And that's why, to a certain extent, you could say uh, for, for uh, Hong Kong culture, uh, uh, Wong Kar Wai can be considered a political filmmaker. So, like, uh, you know, unlike a lot of uh, other filmmakers, he never directly talks about uh, the political situation, right? But this, shall we say, this motif of disappointment, of play things not being in their appointed uh, uh, places, right? Of failure, not just as not being able to get what you want, therefore, uh, you know, uh, therefore you're sad or whatever, right? But, but of what I, I'm calling a politics of failure, right? Not just dare to know, which is what we had before. That's the enlightenment idea. And of course, the trouble with that today is that knowledge becomes something that is in support of what? Power, right? Not like right, Foucault and all this stuff, right? Knowledge is, it, it, it stands behind a power. So you need something a little bit other than that. So uh, a politics of failure is not a kind of, uh, it's not stoicism, it's not a, a, a kind of valorization, right, uh, of, of uh, not being able to do this, this, and that, right? Uh, it's, um, you might say it, it's, a, it's an ethical position, right? It's an ethical position which says uh, 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 you act not because there is hope, but because we just refuse to give in to, to despair. And uh, the kind of politics that might come out of that, I think, are probably at least worth discussing. Right. Steve. Yeah, I want to pick, pick up from there. Uh, I have two uh, kind of related observations and perhaps questions. Um, I want to use this discussion, especially the last example, last case that you gave, uh, to uh, uh, open up an issue that articulates with the two other examples. Right. As right. Of course, then the theme of your right. of your talk uh, this afternoon. So, I mean, we we, we could come back to Hong Kong the failure, right. failure, right. 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 But how, I mean, of course, these three exam these three cases uh, uh, captures the scenario about socialism, mm. uh, uh, as you try to, you know, imagine it, re reimagine it, relevant to the situation today in this context of, you know, located here. But they are also, uh, by, by their, uh, respected nature, very different, like the first one. And yes, the second, okay. yes. The one. I mean, the second one is interesting in a way also, as you argue, with the, the paradoxical way of handling with the individual and the self. Yeah. Right? So I guess I, my, 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 observation, my, my question is maybe, could you say a little bit more how you articulate them? And especially in relation to your first, I mean, one of your earlier point this afternoon, which is, 
uh, it is change itself that has changed. So yeah. how, how that, right. you know, why right. not the, the three right. cases first? Right. Well, I, I mean, um, the, the most general answer to that would be some notion of history and historical change, right? And the way in which history doesn't go like in any way that is easy to understand. Uh, it's not just a question of tracing it back and then if we do that, uh, you see what's happening, right? It's always a question of, of breaks and unpredictabilities. Right? That's what I think uh, 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 some people are now calling uh, uh, the event. Right? An event is not just things that are happening. Right? The event is something that is happening that has never happened before. Right? So, so you can never tell uh, where, uh, where it's going. So like the, in my first example, uh, um, uh, I was sort of, uh, to a certain extent, uh, dealing with the whole question of the uh, neoliberal in terms of uh, uh, corporate images of, the, of themselves. Right? So the, 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 uh, uh, the question was always, why does a, 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 a reactionary institution like CCTV uh, you know, even now, like you know, New Year's, New Year's, they they play all these programs, and if you see the programs they broadcast and see where it's coming from, right? This uh, cool house building. I mean, it's completely contradictory. It doesn't seem to make sense. Why they need a building like that, right? So one way I I, I was trying to sort of uh, maybe understand it. Was to see it as the uh, as the problematics of this whole thing of the individual, which gives you a sense of individuality, but not really. It's a kind of spectral individuality. It's like consumption, right? The, the illusion you get uh, in consumption is that you have choice, right? I mean, the the uh, the, the motto for for Hong Kong's consumers are used to be I don't know whether it's still there choice, right? The, Consumer magazine is called Choice, right? But Choice is something that's like a magic trick, you know? Take a card, any card, right? I don't know what the card is. Take a card, any card. But I mean, you know, it's possible to force a card uh, on people. That's the simplest uh, form of magic, right? And magic, of course, is part of uh, 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 you know, the way in which uh, societies are uh, uh, handled and, 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 and controlled and, and, and and impress uh, upon. So that's one. Ai Weiwei, I think, would be the uh, the instance of an uh, 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 a really, uh, uh, um, in a way, a paradoxical artist. I think Ai Weiwei's work and his relationship to the state is more interesting than the way he himself understands it. Right? I mean, or that a lot of people understand the way they understand it. You know, Ai Weiwei is this sort of fearless uh, 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 protester uh, against injustice uh, and, and, and inequality and so on. That's not exactly true. He's not that kind of guy. I mean, we, we, we know him quite well, actually. He's a very nice guy. I mean, you might, you might be deceived by this sort of aggressive uh, uh, kind of attitude. But he's a very gentle person, right? And uh, uh, in fact, when he was arrested last time, to a certain extent, the police broke him, right? But then, of course, when he got out of jail, he's the defined Ai Weiwei again. You know I mean, it's that, that kind of thing, right? Like, the first time I met him, well, a long time ago, uh, before I actually, and my, my wife is a close friend, uh, it was at the, one of the Venice uh, Biennales, right? Uh, and uh, um, uh, I saw this guy, uh, uh, and, and in the Benelli, all the artworks were on, online, on the computer. There were all these computers all over the room. And I saw Ai Weiwei, and I, who is this guy, right, going to all the computers, putting his work first. <laughs> <laughs> so as soon as, you know, I mean, this is something that you would, I mean, it's, it's very innocent. I mean, that's how he is, right? So anyone who, who switches on, uh, well, first thing they see would be Ai <laughs> Weiwei's uh, work, right? Uh, a pretty innocent kind of uh, strategy, right? So, I mean, it's that sort of thing that you have to sort of uh, uh, keep in mind, right? Uh, and balance against this image of the, the fearless um, uh, 
the defender of justice, which to a certain extent he is. Right? I mean, he does speak out and, and so on and so forth. But the, the deeper logic, right, is this thing of like, number one, learning how to live under toxic conditions. And one of the uh, 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 ways of doing that is to uh, be able to enlist the state as your unconscious collaborator. Right? Now, this is not an easy thing to do. And I think, uh, for me, that's really what is interesting about his work, right? I mean, formally speaking, his work is, uh, is not as interesting as... Uh, like, for example, uh, he, we know he studied at, at Parsons, right? I mean, he, we know that he, he, he's read all about, you know, uh, Duchong and, and, and Dada and so on, right? So you have all these Dada's gestures, which in New York, right? would be nothing. I mean, you know, a dime doesn't. You know, thousands of artists uh, do this, right? But in the different uh, situation of China, right, and, and, and under present Chinese conditions, they have a very different uh, uh, effect and, and purchase. So, yeah. So how, how I guess, uh, yeah, thank mm. you. Uh, how, how do they add up to what kind of picture of Move yeah, the yeah. I mean, the, what I'm trying to say, of course, is this, that it's not as if we know what posthumous socialism is, right? So that it has these characteristics, mm. right? That, that's why I made this comparison with the black hole, mm. right? Because, uh, because uh, politics and, 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 uh, and Chinese experience have now become so dense that you can't, it's like a black hole. You, no light comes out. Right? You, you can't see it directly. Now, how do you, how do you know that it's there? W what do you know about some of its characteristics right? through the effects that, that it produces? Right? So, so the effects would, would allow you to speculate a little bit. And one effect would be an artist like, uh, like I would. And of course, there, there are many, many other examples. Right? I mean, uh, um, uh, for example, uh, uh, Jia Zhangka, uh, a lot of Jajanka's films, or, or this, uh, I think, almost a kind of uh, really uh, precocious film called Crazy English. You know, Crazy English really, to a certain extent, anticipated uh, a lot of this new liberal, uh, uh, I mean, the whole question of the individual. Uh, you, you know Crazy English, I mean, it was a story, a documentary, right, about, uh, um, you know, the, teacher of English in, uh, in China, the most popular teacher, even though he doesn't, his English isn't that good, right? He has no, uh, no knowledge of linguistics. Uh, he teaches people to say things like, I enjoy losing face, <laughs> right? Now, I mean, it's a kind of serious point, <laughs> right? Cause, because he's not teaching a new subject. He's not teaching English as a subject, right? He's teaching us how to become new kinds of subjects, <laughs> right? new liberal subjects <laughs> that, you know, that as, as, uh, enjoy losing face. Uh, and so, I mean, and there, there are like hundreds of examples uh, 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 like that. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, I mean, the question of Hong Kong, I think, would be uh, maybe uh, I would be positioning it as follows. that. Uh, that there's a whole history of the, of the democracy movement, right? There's a question of democracy now, which of course is an absolutely essential uh, 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 question. And because it's so important, you can't approach it through cliches. I mean, you can't say, you know, democracy means, you know, my rights or, or, or whatever. I mean, th there's always a historical specificity Right? There's always something that's happening, and, and it's on these uh, 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 real terms that, that you, you have to negotiate right? uh, how to proceed. Right? It's not just a question of names, because if it's a question of names, right, the greatest defender of democracy would be Chris Patton. He's, he's, he's really a travesty of that. <laughs> Right.
I mean, the, I suppose the gist of what I'm saying, right, uh, uh, one of the gist of what I'm saying is that uh, there's no uh, separation uh, between art and politics. Right? I mean, the, uh, the way you practice art, uh, even though, it, and I was going to follow up with a, uh, another example, which uh, I didn't have time to do, which is a, a very different kind of uh, Chinese artist, uh, uh, um, same as Liu Dan. I mean, he does things like that. Right? Uh, this is a huge work, like uh, 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 eight feet by 12 feet, right? Of a small dictionary, right? Uh, but then, of course, that's what he's usually associated with, right? What looks like completely traditional Chinese art, uh, down to the calligraphy, right? S uh, a scholar's stone, scholar's art, except he's, he's the most paradoxical artist, I think, uh, uh, in ch China uh, today, because uh, he seems completely uh, traditional, but he uses, uh, he uses tradition, like, uh, uh, like the uh, uh, like, like using stuff like that, right? Uh, as what I have called a form of dandyism, right? You know, he he doesn't sort of simply uh, 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 marshal them directly, right? He he uses them uh, uh, for a very different uh, kind of uh, 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 purpose, and here you have the uh, uh, the exact opposite. Of someone like uh, like uh, uh, Ai Weiwei, right? He's elegant. He, he he is in fact a kind of dandy, but at the same time his work is extremely contemporary. Even though it looks, uh, that's what I mean by the anachronistic, right? I mean he has no trouble selling, right? Because people think that he's uh, what you see here is a revival of Song Dynasty painting. Right? So if you're interested in Chinese tradition, you, you, you're going to pay millions for, for this. Right? And of course, what he does is that before he sells his work, he's already spent the money. He's a collector. I mean, that's a, a, how he keeps himself honest, I think. He buys the best you know, uh, uh, stones and artworks and, and, uh, and jades and so on. You find. And before he makes money from the painting, Right, <laughs> he, he has already spent it on 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 on, on the collection. So a very different kind, and um, obviously there is uh, uh, you know neoliberalism would also uh, uh, be a part of the uh, of the art scene, right? Because I mean the whole question of, of deregulation, right? How you might deregulate uh, this and and deregulate that and open up markets and, and all that. I mean, we, we hear a lot of talk about that. But someone like uh, both Ai Weiwei, right, to, to give him credit, and Liu Dan are not part of that mode, right? I mean, uh, uh, Ai Weiwei has a relationship to it because he, he's really a very good businessman, right? I mean, he's, he, he, he made, makes a lot of money. You know that um, that show in in, uh, in in the new Tate Gallery, right? The sun uh, uh, sunflowers, right? And he he you know uh, made millions of these sunflower seeds scattered on on the ground. And of course, what did he do afterwards? He sold each one for one pound, <laughs> right? So there are millions of them. So he sold each one for 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 one pound. And I mean that's like. Maybe a kind of gray area, but that, that's the sort of thing he does, right? I mean, um, it, it, um, well, I mean, the uh, I, I'm thinking about dandyism now in the um, uh, more in the uh, in the Baudelaire sense, right? Where where, where Baudelaire, when we talk about modernism, talks about dandyism as he says, the last spark of heroism in decadent times, right? Why? Because like when everything is falling apart, your own personal, right? Your, your, your own values. Like for example, failure, what I'm calling failure, right? It's a kind of dandyism uh, in, in, this wider, in this wider sense, right? Because it, it's like, it, it's, a, it's a kind of personal ethic that uh, when, when everything else is in ruins, it, it's something that you, you, you have to uh, as a hold on to, to a certain extent, right? 
Hey, mm guys. -hmm. One of the things that I was implying, though it's not something that I want to put my foot down and insist on, is that uh, to see China as a, as a classic oppressor uh, is probably a, a bit of a simplification, which is not to excuse it. You know, I mean, uh, a lot of what China does is really completely unnecessary. I mean, one of the problems with China is that it hasn't gotten over this uh, 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 control uh, 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 mentality, right? I mean, it really has to control things. Uh, I mean, it's it's like you know, it's like a pathology, right? I mean, that's what they uh, they uh, have to do. But you know, um, if you think about what they let's say what they implicitly learned from Tinnaman, I mean, the point I was making about Tinnaman is that the reason why it's uh, it's complicated and this in no way to excuse the massacre. The massacre was, was the massacre. I mean, and that's the word to use, right? Was that the, it was also the first time in, in, in Chinese history where two forms of power, which are now becoming more important, right, met, right, or clash, right? I mean, the old, older power, which is force and so on, and the newer thing, which is, you know, uh, knowledge, information, uh, networks and, and, and so on. And, and the students, very, very much on that side, right? It's a little bit like, uh, uh, you know, the, um, you know the, the, the Jews in Egypt, right? I mean, they, they're the underdogs, they, they, they were not strong, but was it an equal battle against Egypt? No, they had one very important ally, God. Right, God was there. God was there, to, and you know, and it really made it an equal on, on, on the on the other side. Right. So it's I, I mean, the students have information and, and they have news and and, and so, on. Uh, and it's not an attack on the students either. But I mean, it shows you that it's not just a kind of simple uh, uh, question. Of, um, of oppression. And even China now, I, 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 you know, I don't think it's that useful to think about it as simply, you know, uh, uh, you know that, that its DNA is that of oppressing people. Uh, uh, I don't think that's really useful to think in, in, in that sort of way. I mean, it has its problems, it has its uh, 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 mismanagements and, and lack of understanding of, of things, right? But uh, it's a situation that no one is in control of. Right? It's not as if China is in control, right? They are, they are part of this black hole that we're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's a question of uh, arriving uh, at this stage uh, at any kind of clarity. You know, I don't think that, that we're going to get clarity at, at, at this point, right? All we're getting are these uh, different uh, kinds of, like, for example, different politics, uh, different art forms, uh, different kind of performances, and, and then to see uh, where that takes us, right? How the culture and the politics could, uh, to a certain extent, run in tandem uh, with, uh, with each other. Maybe let me give you one context, which is um, uh, Samuel Beckett, right? Uh, who has a famous statement where he says, you know, uh, 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 art fails. Anything else is just good housekeeping, right? I mean, if you, if you try any other approach, right? And it fails because it's, you're always trying to deal with something you don't know, know very much about, right? So if you don't fail, it means you haven't really done anything. You haven't started at all, right? So, I mean, it's that sense of failure, not, not the sense that, you know, you have a goal, a clearly set goal, right? 
uh, which you do not arrive at, and then, then you fail. I mean, it's not that clear cut, right? So, uh, so it, it's back to this whole um, um, uh, question of, uh, of disappointment and how you can have, for example, at, uh, on the affective level, an erotics of disappointment, right? Now, anything else is like really, uh, uh, you know, I mean, it's not disappointment in, in the sense that, all right, you meet someone, you fall in love, you get married, and then you're disappointed. I mean, it's not that form of uh, 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 disappointment, right? It's rather, you know, it's uh, if you begin, I mean, you take the example of uh, uh, in the mood for love, right? The, the situation between the, the, the couple is impossible, right? In other words, uh, what brings them together, which is we don't want to be like our, our relative spouses, right? They cheat on, on you. We don't want to be like that. Now, what brings them together is this we don't want. You get that, right? So it's what, you know, it's this negative effect that brings them together. So by definition, what brings them together is what keeps them apart, sure. right? So it's that erotics that, that the film is exploring. Uh, and it's something that's extremely powerful, very intense, though it doesn't, you know, take the usual configurations, right? I mean, it doesn't end in either uh, tragedy or, 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 or fulfillment or, or, or whatever, right? Does it, end in, it just ends in this, like, you, know, you whisper a secret into, into the tree or, or, or stuff like that, right? So, uh, so with Wong Kar Wai, um, uh, uh, it's failure, right, at an effective level, and how failure becomes uh, the, the, you know, a very powerful and even positive effect, mm -hmm. if you like, right? So what I'm trying to argue is um, that uh, uh, there might be a kind of equivalent to this uh, in, in certain forms of politics that we are seeing now, right? Not just in Hong Kong, but I think, you know, uh, elsewhere as well, right? It, it's not like the, uh, you know, you, you set up certain goals and then you try to achieve them. So if you achieve them, you have succeeded. If you don't, you have failed. Right? Because the goals are now so complex and the situation is so complex that all you can do right, is just keep doing it. Sure. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, Rilke, you know, the, the German poet Rilke said, uh, who speaks of victory mm. to endure is all. Right? So the question of success or failure, who speaks of it to do it or so? Mm. That kind of as an act of refusal to yeah. certain kinds of utility. Yes. Of yes. Yes. Um. Yes. Mm. Mm. Yes. The social system did not collapse, right? I mean, it just went on and it became something a bit different. And uh, one of the uh, uh, tra traumatic moments was exactly Tinnaman, which is what I was trying to pinpoint, right? Which is why Tinnaman is the one thing you can't talk about in China, right? All references uh, to it is out. Right? And, and, uh, uh, how do you deal with the, the trauma of, of Tinnaman? Uh, one of my other arguments would be this, that you can't forget Tinnaman because it's so deeply etched in people's memories. You might try to suppress it, not allow people to talk about it, but that doesn't work, right? The only way, uh, probably the most effective way in, in which you can suppress it is what? To organize the 2008 Olympic Games. You know what I mean by that, right? Like the, you have, uh, you have a, 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 a media event in, in 89 that the whole world saw, right? Uh, uh, to the detriment of, of China's uh, uh, face, right? 
Then, of course, in 2008, you have what? The first time another huge media event, right? And what does forgetting here mean? How do you forget Tinamen? You don't forget it by losing it, it's there, right? You forget it by remembering it, by remembering something else, right? I mean, forgetting is additive. Forgetting is not subtractive. Right? You cannot forget by cutting it out. You can't cut it out. It's always there, right? I mean, you know, even like take, take a, 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 a mark on the wall, right? You try to erase it, the marks of erasure are there. It makes it worse, right? Maybe one way to, as it were, uh, do that is to draw a picture. Right? Turn that ugly thing in, into, in, into something that, that seems to be deliberately put there. Right? Now, when you do that, you add something, but when you add that something, you're erasing it. Right? You're erasing what is there. So, you know, this whole question of the, of the posthumous, right, it's more alive uh, uh, after uh, it, is, it is dead. Uh, 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 um, I think importantly uh, 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 gives us a different idea of, of temporality. Right? It's not temporality as you know you have, you have A and then you have B and then you have C. Right? Whether B is better than A or, or worse than A, but you have a kind of you know, change and progression. Right? But with the with the posthumous, what you have is not that kind of thing. What you have are these overlapping frames. Yeah, overlapping frames all coexisting at the same time, right? So time sort of moves in, in this sort of, also in, in all these zigzag uh, ways. Uh, don't know whether you know, uh, may, uh, for me the clearest uh, um, uh, example of that is this recent film by uh, Chai Ming Lam uh, called What Time Is It Over There? Do people know that, that film? What Time Is It Over There? Uh, the thing is, that in that film, you have four stories and four spaces. You know, I mean, it's also set in Paris, right? So you, you, you have this uh, uh, watchmaker, I mean, watch seller, who has his own space. Uh, you have the father that we meet at the beginning who's dead, right? Who comes back, and then you have the space of that. You, you have the mother waiting for the father to come back. And, and the girl, a Taiwan uh, woman who went to uh, uh, Paris, we don't know why, right? And already there you, you see these four overlapping spaces, right? It's not a chronology where you go from here to here. Uh, you have these sort of superimpositions. Uh, that's why you have this real sort of, you know, it's kind of every scene uh, uh, can be as a scene in, in, in all these different. It's a little bit like uh, what you know what a Venn diagram is. Venn diagram is when you have a, a square and then another square and then another square, and there are points, right, that all these squares might have in common. But if you take that point, that point goes in all these different directions, right? The contacts, if you like, of that point, right, uh, 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 are all these different squares. So it's that kind of temporary, which is what I was trying to get at with, uh, with posthumous uh, uh, socialism, right? More life uh, when it is dead, in the sense that you now have this sort of, this anachronistic superimposition, right, of, of different time frames. And the reason why that is happening, right, is uh, in, with, with one short end term, is speed, right? And by speed, we don't just mean, you know, high-speed rails, we, we mean also uh, media and electronics and information, right? The kind of immediacy that changes your perceptions of, uh, of the world and of death and, and, and time and, and so on, right? And of course, you have that in China. I mean, it's that together with a kind of huge, still a kind of huge uh, rural uh, population, so uh, a lot of people like not that rich, though they're, they're you know they're, they're much better off than, than they used to be, right? And like, which is why I mean, one of the strange things is that it's much more expensive living in China now, in Beijing, for example, and Shanghai, than it is in in New York or, or Irvine, right? You go to a restaurant, I mean, in, in Beijing, unless you live like you know, uh, 
If you live like the locals, this is completely double uh, economy. Live like the locals, you can live very cheaply, right? But if you want a kind of little middle class life, right, it's very different. I mean, for example, motor cars, as you know, uh, in, in China, like twice or three times what they cost in the States. And yet, and yet, you have huge demand for motor cars, which doesn't make sense, right? It's inconvenient and so on and so on. And why is this so? Why do people have this great desire for motor cars? Like, while well, people in New York, for example, right, uh, uh, who are equally uh, well off would say, well, we don't want a car. Well, it seems to me one reason is, uh, is the whole question of, uh, of uh, uh, changes in notion of, of, of privacy, right? Like, what you never had in China uh, under socialism, the old socialism, exactly was this, privacy, right? You, don't, you didn't have privacy. So today, as it were, even though it doesn't make sense, I think a lot of people find a private car, right? A private car, uh, very useful, even though it, it's completely contradictory. Because that's what's causing, I would say, or not the only cause, but that's one main cause, right, for the traffic congestion. Right? So it's not just, you know, a logistical problem. It's also a social uh, an historical question, right? The fact that uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a story in the history of privacy, right? How, how certain, how uh, in, uh, in the old socialism, the one thing you didn't have was privacy, right? People would just go into your house or, you know, you live under crowded conditions or people would just come into your house and it's their own, right? Private property is theft, so, you know, you can't call this house your house. I can come in any time I like. Which is actually what happened to, to us uh, even just 10 years ago. Right? We, we lived in this, uh, in this, you uh, 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 know, 798, this art, uh, so-called art, so-called art village, right? And, and we, we, uh, uh, we had a house there, and one morning a guy just came in, opened the door, came in, looked around, and he said, what are you doing here? He got offended. <laughs> Why can't I be here? <laughs> I, mean, it, I mean, that attitude is still there uh, among some people. You know, together with, of course, the most bourgeois sort of thing about privacy, right? I'm a very private person. My personal space is my own. I mean, you have a lot of that now, right? And a private car would be one, and, and you know, your own home and so on would be instances of that, right? But the, the, you know, that's what I mean by the posthumous. Like the, the, the other stuff is still there. Right? It still exists as, uh, as uh, like traces. Mm. 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 But uh, one of the... Um, Simpler answers would be to point to a kind of uh, what used to be called a history of uh, uneven development, mm -hmm. right? Things don't develop like uh, necessarily uh, 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 in tandem uh, with each other. And one of the best examples here, of course, and you know, because of these historical factors, uh, the different ways in which Hong Kong and China developed like, in the last 20 years, right? And of course, as you know, Hong Kong's uh, importance and prosperity uh, was very much based um, in the old days on the fact that China was closed, right? Because China was a closed system. Uh, Hong Kong was like this doorway, right? Exactly a pot, right? A door uh, opening up. And the, the more crises there are, the more wars there are, the more isolated China uh, becomes, right, the more important Hong Kong becomes. Right? Now, the problem is that now with the opening up of China, number one, there are many more cities that can perform the role that only Hong Kong could perform before. Right? Even across, I don't know whether you've been to Shenzhen recently. Right? I haven't been to Shenzhen for like 15 years. So it's a real shock. I mean, you go to Shenzhen now, it's like, you know, 
but at least as sort of modern and, and as, as advanced as Hong Kong. I mean, my impression of Shenzhou is still like this little village where I go to to buy fake watches. Right? I, I, I used to do this, this trip many times a week when I was collecting fake watches in, in Hong Kong. <laughs> right? So the only place you could do that was go over to, to, uh, to Shenzhen, which is you know, at least like you know, these kinds of malls we would sell fakes. Right? Not anymore. Right? It, it's all these uh, you know, Hong Kong style malls. Uh, so the, the whole history of, of, um, of uh, uneven development and all these historical uh, 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 bricks, um, I think sometimes have affected uh, uh, Hong Kong people, uh, in, at least psychologically in a certain way. Now here, of course, it's, uh, you know, this is not exact what I'm going to say now. But it's as if, you know, for a long time, I think people, Hong Kong people, had a kind of a superiority complex vis-a-vis -vis China, partly because of the wealth differential. Right? You remember in the old days, there were these TV, TV series about Ah Chan, right? Right? I mean, Ah Chans were, were these sort of country bumpkins uh, from from China. Of course, now they are our bosses. They buy out, uh, buy up our real estate. They buy up our corporations, and so on and so forth. Right? They take our jobs, right? They take our businesses, and uh, well, these people that, that we used to look down on, right, as our cultural and economic inferiors, are now our bosses. And I think that there's uh, there's certainly an element of that, right, in in the relationship to uh, uh, to China, right, a kind of uh, uh, distrust, but also a kind of ignorance. Ignorance in, in the sense that you, like, like you, you insist on living in this free state, right? As if China ha has, hasn't moved uh, in, uh, in, in all these years, which of course is not the case. Now, it that doesn't necessarily ha have moved for the better. Right? It's not necessarily more democratic or anything, but, but the bottom line is that it's no longer what it used to be. Right? And if you want to address the issue, of Hong Kong's relationship to China. You'll have to address the issue of what the relationship is now, right? What, what China is now. And of course, it's a crucial issue to, to address, but the only way in which we can address it, right, is by knowing what the facts are, right? Knowing, knowing what is there on the ground, right? This is not, this is not an argument uh, or an excuse for, for the things that China is doing. It's, it's an argument for, for uh, you know, people who believe in democracy in, in Hong Kong, right, to as well be sharper in, in their thinking and their tactics, right, and not rely on like abstract notions of what democracy is, which is easy. As I say, you know, if that, if, you know, if you can do that, then the, the great champion is Chris Patton, right? I mean, he's given us all the, these books and so on. So it's not that. I mean, it's really, we need this sort of uh, uh, maybe painful and careful uh, re-examining re of our own positions and our own prejudices and our own cliches, right? If, if you want to, like, really uh, advance the political argument. I mean, whether there's a solution or not, uh, you don't know because it's also this whole, this whole uh, 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 you know, power thing. You know, it's like I was reading this book on strategy, and the uh, the book begins with a line from uh, from uh, Mike Tyson, the boxer, a right? famous line where Tyson said, uh, "In boxing, everyone has a plan until he's punched in the mouth." <laughs> 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 I mean, that strategy, it's like, you know, we, we all think we know what the strategy is, but then there are the conditions on the ground, right, which can be unpredictable and not the way you have imagined it. But that's where you have to really start doing the thinking. One more burning question. <laughs> 
Well, let's see if I understand what you're saying. Uh, the, um, uh, you're, you're asking whether art can be authoritative or authoritarian, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, the notion being that uh, politicians could be authoritarian, artists are the, uh, at least free spirits who, who don't believe in being authoritarian. Yeah. That's a myth. I mean, uh, artists are like you and me, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean, there's some who are like this and others who are not. I mean, the most uh, uh, authoritarian people, are, some of the most authoritarian people I know are, in fact, artists, or, or rather, that's their job, right? To make art, and sometimes they want to make it extremely precisely. They want to do this, 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 and that way, right? I mean, the, the, the image of the artist as a free spirit, right, while the politician is this person who wants to control us, uh, is sometimes true, but sometimes not true. I mean, the reverse can also be the case. If it's like that, then yeah. how can this antagonism exist? Between what? Art, art and politics. Kind of a, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we're talking about the, uh, a particular kind of art, which is I Weiwei's. Right? in a particular social-political situation, which is China today. Right? And in China, the political situation is it's not just socialist, right? it's just socialist market economy, right? which is a kind of, I'm trying to call it a kind of posthumous socialism. I mean, the, the very uh, uh, term itself is what in rhetoric is called a catechesis, right? uh, uh, the, the wrong use of a word. right? Because it's a contradiction, in a sense. Socialist and market economy are, ex I mean, market economy is exactly what socialism is not, right? So you come up with the phrase, socialist market economy, as if the only way China can describe itself now, right, is through this figure of a wrong word, right, a catechesis. Now, catechesis, of course, goes together with a lot of other things that are going on, right? Anachronism has a parallels this, right? And anachronism means, you know, it's not like you follow certain chronologies of these overlapping chronologies, right? And the, thought, and the third term, and I, I, I really think that these are three crucial figures for trying to imagine China today. Uh, the third term would be anamorphosis. Right. And morphosis would be the way in which uh, uh, what we see as change is not like act, it's not like the, the 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 actual thing changing. It's the goods that are changing, the way we understand uh, uh, the image. It's that that's changing. You understand? I mean, oh, let me just give you an example, uh, like a preserved building. Right? A preserved building looks, or you try to make it look exactly the same as it, what, as it used to be. Right? But has it changed? I mean, you want to preserve it, you don't want it to change, but has it, of course it has changed, because uh, preserved buildings are now what? Uh, uh, part of this whole logic of global tourism. Right? You, you preserve buildings, you preserve uh, uh, cultural areas, uh, and that is part of the logic of, of global tourism. So even though the building looks the same, right? it's preserved, it looks the same, the, the way you understand it, the grids by which you understand it, all these grids have changed. Right? I mean, it's no longer the case that we used to you know, talk about in, in, in modernism when you say, you know, the more things change, the more they remain the same. Right? Now you have the opposite. The more things remain the same, <laughs> the more they change. Right? I mean, they might look the same. Right? You don't see a difference, but you know, it's like oh, the grids have changed. Right? The way you understand what you're seeing, that has changed. Right? So the thing, you know, the, the appearance might not have changed. Right? Like a preserved building, right? you're trying to make it exactly the same as what it is. Right? So that's partly what I mean by an anamorphosis, right? You know what an anamorphosis is, where you, uh, instead of uh, having an image on this grid, let's say, parallel grid, right? You choose another grid, which is like that, 
right? And what you do is you transpose every point on the first grid to a point on the second grid, right? Now, when that happens, is it a distortion? No, because it's very precise. You have a precise transcription from one grid to another grid, except it's a transcription that now makes it unrecognizable, right? So, I mean, th that's a sense of what I like to call uh, a phenomenon that is precise but illegible, right? Something that is precisely illegible. So the, the, the yeah. new grid uh, yeah. that's come up is uh, from China is, uh, yeah. you know, socialism with Chinese characters. Well, I mean, that is another. That's the latest yes. grid, right? Yes. <laughs> See, I mean, that's another catechesis, right? The last mm -hmm. way was socialism with the Chinese characteristic. Mm -hmm. So now the latest is the further, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, yeah. By yeah. adding right. the so-called right. the new era, right. which could be a completely yes. Yes new yeah. formation. Right. No, I mean, here you have a, a also a kind of language question, right? Because <laughs> right. you have something that's happening that you have no idea what it is, right? Which means that the terms used to describe it are a little bit ad hoc, mm -hmm. right? And that's where the catechesis comes in. But catechesis, of course, are, are very illuminating. Right? Because catechesis shows you not what something is, but what you want something to be. Right? I mean, what it shows is the force of a, of a desire, as they, as they would say. Right? I mean, you want it to be like that. Right? Like, uh, 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 you know, socialist market economy all works well. Right? We can have everything. Market economy and socialism, just as you say, add with Chinese characteristics, and that, that's the nationalism uh, thrown in. So right. stir it, and then you have your. Right. Mm. Right. You were actually talking about films earlier. Yeah. Giving examples of, of yeah. Wong Kar Wai and, yeah. and the other film. Um, because anamorphic is, is a word yeah. that's connected to anamorphic transfer, is connected yes. with, with films. Yes. So I think this could be an interesting um, yes. model. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, films certainly would be a kind of privileged site to, uh, to study a lot of these things. And I don't think it's an accident that if you want to uh, talk about what's happening in China today, for example, uh, uh, many films uh, would be like kind of cutting edge, right? But not just China, like Hong Kong, for example. It's like, you know, in the lead up to, uh, to 97, it's like the most interesting things, culturally speaking, in, in Hong Kong was the Hong Kong cinema, right? It became a world cinema at the moment, at that moment of crisis, right? It's that moment of crisis that turned Hong Kong cinema from being a local, right? A local Cantonese speaking or, 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 or at most a regional cinema into, into something else. And, the, uh, and I think the key to that is this new sense of, uh, the local that we are getting, because you have a local that is now dislocated, right? A local that has no clear locale, right? So that that sense of the local is something of, of this dislocated local is something that you can experience in Hong Kong, and people, let's say, in Taipei, right, or in Mumbai, uh, or, 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 or or in Istanbul, right, would be able to recognize. Right? Because it's exactly that dislocated uh, 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 localism, uh, these dislocated locales that I suppose are caused by so many different things. Well, one of them being, to use a shorthand term for this very complex phenomenon, uh, globalization. What, what would be your materials? What would be your, your resources? Right. Now, um, take something like the New York Times, which is a very sort of important section uh, on China. I mean, China is one of the, 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 the focus. And the reporters for the New York Times are very knowledgeable right, about China and so on. Except when I read the New York Times, I always find that the angle 
is slightly off. Yeah, I mean, they're paying critical attention, so-called, uh, to what's happening, so they report everything, right? But it's as if sometimes there's this angle which they don't get, because, and the angle has something to do with, like, for example, if you're reporting from, let's say, uh, uh, the United States, then one of the things that people, like the myth that people believe in in the United States is that it's where you know, people believe in freedom and democracy and so on and so on, which is, of course, partly true, and that's a problem, right? It's not entirely true, it's partly true. So, for example, when you criticize, when the U.S. criticizes uh, China for its human rights record, and it doesn't have a very good human rights record, right? But when it does this, part of what is happening is that they're saying, look at us. Right? Look at how nasty you are, which means, right, if I can criticize you, I'm not like that. Yeah, I mean, this is what, um, so what, what, what someone like Baudrillard would call a, a, a deterrent strategy. Right? I mean, you do this in order to show not that that is so, but that I'm not like that. Right? So I think a lot of these, uh, 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 which is not to say that China cannot be faulted. <coughs> on its human rights record, right? But, you know, the U.S. can be faulted for that as well. But this strong criticism has something to do. See, my interest for a long time has been fakes, right? Why is it that, uh, that Switzerland spends so much time uh, attacking fakes and so on and so forth? Of course, it's, it's afraid that when you find out that the way Swiss watches are made, are almost exactly the same as the way in which fake watches are made. I, I kid you not. I mean, I, I kid you not. I mean, that, that's really the case. Because the, the best fake watches, right, at a certain point, the so-called A4, you've heard of those, right? The, the A4, how are they made, right? They, they, they're made by, as it were, buying a movement from a Swiss factory, right, and, 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 and casing it. But this is exactly how so-called authentic Swiss watches are made, right? That's what they do. Very few Swiss companies produce their own movements, only two or three, right? Rolex, for example, only recently started producing its own movements, right? Never used to produce its own movements. Used to buy movements from, the, from these uh, factories. So, for example, in Switzerland, therefore, right, makes this sort of moral... Uh, 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 campaign against fakes, you know, fakes are cheating and whatever. I mean, it's not that simple, <laughs> right? I mean, there's also this other subtext which says that, you know, if I can say you are fake, right, it means that what you're buying from me is authentic and not fake, right? So it's determined strategy that, that is working. That's why you have to publicize uh, how these watches are being destroyed. So right? Your comment the other day that uh, Picasso uh, yeah. make, can make his own fakes just as well. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean that, that I think is a really, that, that's a really good insight into what a fake is, right? Yeah. A fake is not just like what people, it's like if I repeat myself, right? If I repeat myself, I'm actually faking, mm. right? As much as, as someone who's copying me. I can, you know, Picasso said, I can make fake Picassos as well as anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why when we were shown a painting <laughs> that, that this friend said he knew Picasso had painted, uh, even though Picasso insists it's a fake, right? <laughs> His reply to this was, you know, I can paint fake Picassos as well as anybody else. But you see, these might seem to be like strange and marginal subjects. Right? I mean, fakes might seem to be a, a really marginal, but it's not. It's really a central, uh, a central uh, 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 aspect of um, the global division of labor. Like, for example, one of the things that uh, uh, the, uh, these companies are always complaining about is that with fakes, they lose profit. Right? But of course, what you see happening in China, let's take the case of, of watches. Uh, like, China used to know only two brands, maybe three, right? Like Rolex and Omega. Mm -hmm. That's all they knew, right? 
What happens when you introduce faith? It's like what you're doing is free advertising. I mean, think about the money you save, <laughs> right? Like with fakes, people now start to learn about, I don't know, Patek Philippe, Bulgari, you know, uh, 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 watches like, like those, right? Which they've never heard of before. So what this does is that it creates a market, right? Uh, you have the images, the information uh, 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 that is being uh, uh, disseminated. You have, for example, the, the other aspect of, of this would be the way in which, uh, if you think about clothes now, the way in which uh, America, uh, to make profits, uh, outsource labor. And outsourcing means, of course, you know, you, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, competency, is, uh, the, the technology transfer has taken place, right? So, so you want me to produce uh, 10,000 shirts, right? Uh, uh, Amani shirts, okay, I'm going to uh, make 11,000 and then I'll know how to make the next uh, 10,000 uh, exactly like this. Right? So, I mean, that's how it works. I mean, it's a, it's a much more complicated process than simply, right, you know, the, uh, the, the moralistic view of faking uh, would, would uh, have us believe. Because you know, it cuts in many different ways. Mm. Mm. So you're yeah. not like Highway Way. You, you, you sell your watches for more than one dollar. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, Highway Way uh, calls the studio the fake factory, right? Oh. <laughs> no, no, I mean, that, that's what he, 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 he you know, fake, fake factory, so, yeah. <laughs> now, but, I mean, why Highway Way sells his seats for one, one dollar, one pound each. But he sells a million of them, <laughs> 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 right? <laughs> that's also a, a basic principle of uh, of business, right? Quantity and uh, yeah.